you know, I was a bit overwhelmed. You know, a lot of products had, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 even ingredients and even more. And I just kept thinking to myself, like, this, there's got to be a better way. Like, this is too much. Like, I almost felt a bit overwhelmed. Welcome to Ask the Beauty Advisor, a podcast that answers your health and beauty questions. Hosted by health and beauty advisor, Deanna Lynn. Hello, 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 and thank you for joining me today. I am so excited about today's episode. I have a very special guest on today for you. Now, if you've ever listened to the show before, you know I love to share beauty products with you. Anytime I find an exceptionally great beauty product or a unique product, I love to have them on the show and talk about them. And today is no exception. Today's guest is Whale Stoffy one of the founders and developers of Shortlist Skincare. Whale is going to educate us. He's got a lot of really great information about some of the top anti-aging ingredients. So you're not going to want to miss out on this episode. Without further ado, we're going to jump right into that interview. Hey, Weil. Thank you so much for coming on today. I'm excited about today's show. So welcome to Ask the Beauty Advisor. And thank you for having me, Dana. Well, it's my pleasure. Weil, I'd like to start today by maybe you telling the listeners just a little bit about your background, your experience, and how you got involved with skincare. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, Probably at an early childhood age, I was always fascinated by the human body. And so naturally, as I went into college, I majored in biology. I went on and got my doctorate degree in pharmacy. Um, but like I said, my curiosity for just the human body has always been there. And when I um, first went into the working world as a professional, it was with uh, Procter & Gamble right out of pharmacy school. And, um, and I was in our division, which was primarily working on pharmaceutical drugs. And, uh, you know, as all big businesses tend to move businesses in and out, uh, once we divested that business, I kind of was in a bit of a uh, in-between of like, well, do I want to continue doing pharmaceuticals or do I want to work um, in the broader part of uh, Procter & Gamble, which was into their, um, call it personal health care and beauty and grooming organizations. So I spent a little bit of time working in both of those. And what I really started to appreciate was sort of the value uh, that the company puts on science in general. And I was actually really surprised uh, at the level of depth that we had spent, you know, investigating everything from topical skincare products to even, you know, topical um, products for pain relief, like in our VIX line. So I quickly started gravitating to the areas where I had personal passion for. And um, one of those was really combining sort of my healthcare background with also the beauty and grooming space. And so I had um, done a couple of uh, different assignments in this area, um, but I've always had a personal passion for how do I use my healthcare background to then apply that to making people look and feel younger and more beautiful. Well, I can certainly hear the passion in your voice for skincare. <laughs> You're one of the founders and developers of a skincare line called a Short List. So now tell us a little bit about shortlist skincare and why you use a short list of ingredients in your skincare. Yeah, I mean, that's it. well, simply put, we set out to create a clean beauty product. And so the background to that is, you know, as I was first learning about the category and really getting more in depth, you know, in pharmacy school, I got a lot of um, uh, information on just how the skin works as a whole. Um, but we didn't spend a lot of time talking about like topical cosmetics. And, you know, as I was learning the category and coming in and just sort of doing basic homework, I would just walk the shelves uh, in, in stores and just pick up bottles and not just buy a bunch of things, but I would flip the bottle back and always look towards ingredients. And I remember going through these ingredient lists and just saying, oh my God, like even me with my doctorate degree, I have a hard time deciphering what's even doing what. 
And so that led to further investigation on my part to say, oh, okay, well, this is an emollient. This is um, a preservative. This is this. This is that. But, you know, I was a bit overwhelmed. You know, a lot of products had, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 even ingredients and even more. And I just kept thinking to myself, like, this, there's got to be a better way. Like, this is too much. Like, I almost felt a bit overwhelmed. Um, and so as I took a step back and said, now, if I was a general consumer or just someone shopping the beauty category, what are they thinking? And so that was part of the genesis of saying, you know, I'm not even convinced you need everything in there. And I wonder if there's a way to make a clean beauty product that just gives you the essential ingredients that you need but still delivers the efficacy that you would expect from a superior product. And that's kind of where I had like my pharma background with just the nuts and bolts of what you need to help design basically a product that was minimal in the ingredients, but maximal in its efficacy. And that's really where we started to build sort of ground up our approach. And then we took a step back and said, okay, well, let's simplify the regimen as a whole. Like I know there's, there's K beauty where there's 10 steps out there, but really, really what are the multitasking ingredients and which are the ones that we are essential to just great skincare. And so we wound up making two products, um, simplifying not just the products themselves um, with proven effective ingredients, but then even trying to simplify the regimen. And, and not just that, like you're always going to need an SPF and we don't have an SPF right now. SPF cream is by far the most important, as you know, and many of your viewers know. Um, and then you also have to cleanse and exfoliate to a certain degree. But we wanted to start with two of the most core products that you would potentially need in your beauty care regimen. All right. Well, I, I understand that. So the first two products that you developed or your core products are the moisturizer and serum. Is that correct? Correct. All right. So let's dive into some uh, cosmetic ingredients. Well, what do you consider to be the most powerful anti-aging cosmetic ingredients? Tell us about some of those ingredients. Yeah. So our cream um, really is centered around retinol. Now, retinol, as you know, is one of the most well-established published um, ingredients for for skincare as a whole. Um, there's multiple strengths, multiple forms. You know, derms use it as sort of their go-to um, medicine and prescription when they're looking to do cosmetic um, benefits. It also stretches into the acne um, realm as well. But then as you start to dial back into what are the ones that are in the, the levels that are in cosmetic products, you know, not all retinol products are created equally. There's multiple different forms of retinol. And so what we tried to do was scour the literature on what forms of retinol work, um, work best, and also are tolerated well. Um, I recall drawing back on my experience, you know, just as a pharmacist going through school, I recall um, dispensing Retin-A to several folks. And the number one gripe was, hey, it works great for my acne. But then, oh my God, my, I'm peeling, I'm getting red. You know, people had a hard time, you know, sticking to leveraging sunscreens. And, and uh, you know, I saw the gamut of how retinol, though very, very effective, can be very, very irritating. So we intentionally narrowed in on retinol propionate. And retinol propionate is basically the esterified form of retinol and how your body normally stores it. So as you know, retinol is vitamin A. And vitamin A, we don't make normally in our body. We have to ingest it. And when you ingest it, your body goes through a series of steps of either leveraging it and using it in the, in the active form of retinoic acid, or it stores it in an esterified form. So you have a palmitate and a propionate. And so when we were going through and evaluating what type of retinol, we narrowed in on propionate because there was more scientific literature that supported uh, the fact that it was less irritating. I also get a lot of questions about retinol polysorbate. Can you explain what that ingredient really is? Retinol polysorbate is actually, so the polysorbate component, which sticks on the retinol, is actually an emulsifying component. And so, as you know, um, emulsifiers in general help 
what our oil loving and water loving components mix well together to stay in formulation in a cream. And so when they put that on there, that helps it interact with the water phases of a, of a, of a component of a cream or a formula. Okay, got you. I understand that. Now, there's another ingredient that seems to be really popular in a lot of creams. In fact, you've even included it in your formula, and that's something called niacinamide. Is that right? Niacinamide. <laughs> yeah. Niacinamide. Well, niacinamide is a form of vitamin B3. And we did the same sort of approach on this. So niacinamide is in our serum. That's in there as well with sodium hyaluronate and um, glycerin. But going back to niacinamide, niacinamide has been one of those, uh, you know, I'm not going to use the word miraculous, but when you start to evaluate the decades of research that is behind niacinamide, it becomes really compelling and really obvious that it that it that it's a workhorse in a lot of um, topical skin ingredients. Um, so for example, it strengthens the surface of your skin or what we call the moisture barrier or lipid bilayer. Um, but it it literally makes everything about your skin better. It it, it improves dullness, blotchiness, hyperpigmentation, even skin tone. Uh, and and when I talk about sort of the workhorse um, there's a lot of data that basically suggests that um, this is one of those essential nutrients that your skin needs to just build better skin and build a better barrier. Uh, there's also another cosmetic ingredient that almost seems to be a trend, and everybody seems to be looking for it in their skincare, and that's something called hyaluronic acid. Now, some people confuse that with like a harsh acid. Tell us what you know about hyaluronic acid. Well, so it depends. There's acid forms. There's salt forms. We use basically um, what we call sodium hyaluronate. So that's a salt form of it. But hyaluronic, hyaluronic acid is, is a naturally occurring um, uh, a chemical in your body, basically. It's, it's ubiquitous in all mammals. Uh, and and it's, it's mainly in sort of the component of connective tissue, uh, when I go back to like my healthcare, you know, background and I was learning about joints and synovial fluid inside of a joint, that's where the bulk of your hyaluronic acid lives. And that's what keeps that, that fluid to stay viscous. So hyaluronic acid naturally is occurring in your body. And in fact, we have about 15 grams of hyaluronic acid in your entire body. And you're, and, and it's, it's in what we call um, high molecular weight versions and low molecular weight versions, are, they, they conglomerate within the body and your body is constantly turning them over and rebuilding them within your body. It's, it's, it's pretty well cited in the literature that about a third of that total amount is sort of recycled and resynthesized every day. So you can kind of see how the body is constantly making it, breaking it down, making it, breaking it down because the joints where it works the most um, are are typically where you want it to be the freshest, if you will. So the unique thing about hyaluronic acid or any of the salt forms of hyaluronic um, acid is that it can hold up to a thousand times its weight in water. And we call it oftentimes in the field is like the super moisturizer. It literally acts like a sponge in, in providing moisture to repair dry skin. So when you put it in the surface of the skin, like you get it right into that surface layer. What it does is it actually can grab moisture from the air and lock that in. And it also retains the moisture that you would normally lose through a compromised skin barrier. So we call that top layer of the skin really your moisture barrier. And sodium hyaluronate actually acts as almost like the mortar that would be in between the bricks and mortar of any kind of building. So it, it helps create that ultra moisturizing effect and helps build that skin barrier that, you know, your skin was always intended to have. And that we have when we're younger in age, it's just as we age, our skin constantly gets insulted by UV rays, it's constantly insulted by environmental exposure, and, you know, the things that we just don't always take care of ourselves for. And 
like a, a, over time and with age, your body is less able to repair um, what it could have done in its earlier years of life. And so sodium hyaluronate really is one of those super moisturizers that comes in and really helps repair that moisture barrier. Now, um, in our product and shortlist, we've used uh, a low molecular weight um, hyaluronic acid. And I know that, or I'm sorry, a sodium hyaluronate. And I know that there's a lot of talk about, you know, hyaluronic acid injections and how are they being absorbed into the skin. And it all really depends on the size of the actual molecule that you're using. And as a, as a beauty care company, you can purchase high molecular weight hyaluronic acid or sodium hyaluronate, or you can purchase the low molecular weight version. Um, but the common thing uh, when trying to put anything into the skin is you also have to look at the size of the molecule that you're trying to get to go through the skin and sort of the rule of thumb that we use. And I think it's kind of a general um, rule in the industry is anything over 500 kilodaltons in size typically doesn't want to penetrate into your skin. So if you put it on top of your skin, it just stays at the surface. And then once you start going into the lower, lower than 500 kilodalton, um, size, those are when molecules can start to penetrate. So when I refer to low molecular weight um, sodium hyaluronate, that actually is in the two to 300 um, uh, kilodalton range. Isn't the lower weight or smaller molecule hyaluronic considered to be more irritating to the skin? It penetrates into the skin and can cause irritation. What are your thoughts on that? There's a lot of theory about that, and the research, I would say, points several different ways. If I, if you, it depends on the school of thought that you want to take. Um, but I would just say for us, for shortlist, what we've done is we've put the molecular weight that's going to stay right into the skin surface because that's where you're going to see the most efficacy. Because hyaluronic acid does, as you say, hold so much water into the skin or so much moisture into the skin, it also draws moisture to the skin. And as you get older, your skin cells kind of flatten. I would think hyaluronic acid would also give the skin a little plumpness, making the skin appear more youthful. Yeah, it does plump the skin some, right, to a certain degree. Um, but what you really are trying to aim for is when you build that top layer, that surface layer of your skin, and get that to a place to where it's holding moisture in more, what that does is it kind of creates almost like an optimal environment for everything happening below into the deeper layers of the skin. So as you know, our skin turns over and we generate new skin every 28 days. And, and different aspects of the skin cycle are taking place. And when you put a, a nice surface, a nice moisture barrier on top, it allows the lower layers of the skin to create better skin cells, which eventually migrate up to the top of the skin or the surface of the skin. And if you're making better cells in the deeper parts of the skin that eventually get to the surface of the skin, it's almost like this self-fulfilling prophecy of creating better starting material to get to better ending material on the top layers of the skin. So it's really, it's almost like the components of putting fertilizer in your garden. The better fertilizer you have, the better fruits and vegetables are going to come out of that garden. And so, and then it's almost like paralleling to like the roof of a house. You know, if you have a house with a roof that's leaking over time, you know, the interior of your house is going to, is going to break down. Whereas if you fix that roof, the interior can stay, you know, in good form. You know, I hate to keep using these analogies, but but it really is at the surface of your skin where all these products act. And that's why it's so important to get the products across the surface, but into the surface. Okay, well, that does make more sense. Yeah. Now, there's a skincare ingredient that kind of gets a bad rap, and that's alcohol. Anytime a client or a consumer picks up a skincare product, and they see that word alcohol in there, they go, yuck, alcohol. They kind of freak out about the product. They don't want to buy something that has alcohol in it. 
You know as well as I do that there are good and bad alcohols. Can you explain why alcohol is used in most skincare products? Yeah. Um, so there are fatty alcohols um, that we use in, in, in products that actually help solubilize um, sort of the oil and water components to what we talked uh, earlier. Um, but I would say ethanol, alkanol, alcohol, like the type that you use to like clean an abrasion or clean a cut, yeah, that tends to strip away some of the natural oils in your skin. And typically when you start to disrupt that oil-water balance that you have, and especially in the upper layers of your skin and going down, that's when you start to compromise the integrity of what your skin's intended to do, which was keep things out. So I would say not all alcohols are created equally, um, just like several other ingredients. Uh, so so it's, it's important to you know, not just flip the back of the bottle and see alcohol, um, but then to read what the intent, what the purpose of those for that specific alcohol. Right, right. Well, now let's talk about the quality of the ingredients themselves. Is there different qualities of ingredients, let's say like a pharmaceutical grade versus a cosmetic grade? What are your thoughts on that? Is there really a big difference between the two? Right, yeah. Actually, I know this isn't a straightforward answer, but I would say it depends. Now, both cosmetic and pharma-grade ingredients are subject to FDA regulation. And really, really, the devil is in the details of how the FDA allows those products to be less than a certain percentage pure. So, for example... If you're using a pharma grade ingredient that goes into a pharmaceutical product that a doctor has to write a prescription for, there is a there is a level of evidence that the FDA will hold this company to if they come in and do an inspection, and it's the product has to be no less than 99% pure. Whereas a cosmetic grade um, ingredient has no less than 70% pure. Now, the intended use going into a cosmetic product versus a pharma-grade product, basically the difference is in the amount of testing that the FDA would ask you to show if they ever came and inspected you. Now, with that being said, you still may get pharmaceutical-grade products being sold in cosmetic channels, but they're probably going to be a little more expensive because in order for the manufacturer to produce at pharma-grade, they're going to have to have a certain number of checks and balances and the manufacturing process in place such that if they ever get audited by the FDA, that they're prepared to prove their level of purity. So it's not an easy answer on that one. If someone says, hey, we're 100% pharma grade, then there is a way to actually look up. Um, there's USP specifications that, um, that, that pharma industry uses that you can actually look. There's actually seals of approval where there's independent organizations that will go and grade these things. Uh, USP is a common seal I've seen on a lot of products. Um, so it's not a straightforward answer, but technically, if you were to say I was 100, or I, I'm only using pharmaceutical grade materials, then that infers that you're getting them from a manufacturer that if they were put under FDA scrutiny, would pass the 99% pure test. Whereas if you're only doing cosmetic, then it would only be held to a standard of 70% pure. Now, for example, we talked about niacinamide earlier. Um, ours is, is pharma grade. It's 99.9% .9 pure. Um, and that's just one of the manufacturers that we, we source from. We actually err towards pharmaceutical grade for all, for all of our products if and where available. And also if it's non-animal um, sourced. And if it's also sustainably sourced. So we put a couple different filters on it. And so you can't always meet all of those criteria, but that's our first opt to where we look. Well, that's definitely good news. And I like to hear that. My skin can definitely tell the difference between the two. If I use a product that has maybe lower quality ingredients, my skin will let me know. It's very sensitive and it will appear blotchy. So there really is a difference no matter what anybody says. There is a big difference in the two. And that's why I prefer to use professional skincare. 
Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, another area that like just is in the back of my head as we talk about like pharma grade versus cosmetic grade is the, the use of extracts. There's so much variability in the use of extracts. Like I'm a huge fan in that, you know, all of our science really is born from nature. I mean, we get inspiration from nature to develop these products, but there's a fine balance of what I'll actually take from nature and put into a product versus what I'll chemically synthesize. And the reason for that is because oftentimes it's very, very hard to isolate that one thing that's coming from nature and keep it pure enough to give you what it is, what it is you need. So I recall like some extracts that, you know, we'd looked at in the past, like certain tea extracts or tea or call it green tea leaf extracts that might contain 40 or 50 different ingredients on their own. And several of those, we can't even characterize what they are. So in putting on my hat of only giving you the things that you need, this is another filter that we looked at and in, in trying to select our ingredients and be really intentional about the role that they play and, 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 and making your skin feel and act younger, but then just the role that they play when, when, when you're buying a product. Like we don't want to give you anything you don't need. Right. Well, besides having a short list of ingredients in your skincare line, what else makes Shortlist more unique or different from any other skincare line that's on the market? What we were able to do was create a formulation that allows you to use retinol in a normal convenient uh, form, which is basically a, a jar, a typical jar that you would see. I don't know if you re recall a lot of retinol containing products, especially when you look at like the prescription side of the business. If you ever get a bottle of Retin-A, the first thing you do is it's, it's a kind of like a foil, firm feeling tube. You take the cap off and there's, it's, it's what they call hermaphroditically sealed. So you, you take the other end of the cap, turn it over and you pop the top of the lid. Well, the reason for that is because retinol as a whole is very, very sensitive to oxygen, whether that's coming from the air or whether that's coming from the, the oxygen component of water. And so right when you pop that seal, your retinol starts to degrade. And once it degrades, it becomes less effective. What we were able to do, and we've filed some patents on this, though they haven't been granted just yet just because it's a lengthy process to get patents approved, but we found a technique in order to be able to protect the retinol in the oil phase of our cream such that it stays away from oxidation. And what you can do is you can use the jar and leave the cap off. I'm not suggesting you leave the cap off, but you can take the cap off and not have to worry about your retinol degrading really quickly over time. So we've designed it to just fit in your normal skincare regimen as you normally would any jar. And the retinol is protective and it stays potent um, over the time that we, uh, over the, over the course of a normal beauty care product. Wow. That's really pretty amazing. I'm really impressed with that because I do see that oxidation happen to a lot of cosmetics that contain, well, mostly I see it with the vitamin C, sometimes with the retinol in some products, but I didn't know it was such a big problem with the retinol also, but a lot of active ingredients I know have an expiration date on them. Yeah, well, vitamin A is very, it's very light and very um, water sensitive. So it degrades quickly. And, and oftentimes, people don't always pay attention to the, to the actual expiration date. When you get a prescription product, oftentimes those are good for 60 to 90 days. And there are a lot of over-the-counter retinol-containing products that are shelf life of 12 months. So um, it's just something to be aware of. Um, and the other nuance that you see is a lot of retinol products are, are squeezed out of little tubes or pumps where, the, where they really try to minimize the air uh, exposure, which is, which is great. We just have taken it to a more convenient form. So we have niacinamide, glycerin, um, sodium hyaluronate, and retinol. So when you use those products in combination, that's where you really get the magic of what we tried to put together. We looked at those as the four real key ingredients and in what you need to put into a product. And so those gravitated into the two products that we have together. And it's really when you use the, that duo, you actually have 
further uh, enhanced penetration into the skin surface of those ingredients when you use them together rather than one being used in isolation. Now, a skincare product does have to have a certain amount of these cosmetic ingredients that you're talking about. They do have to have a fair amount or a certain amount of that ingredient in them to really do anything or to be effective. Is that correct? Because sometimes you'll see retinol, the ingredient retinol, way at the bottom of the list. So you wonder how much retinol is really in there. Absolutely. Right. And and what I would say, if I look at percentages, I'd say they're dictated by a few things. But probably first and foremost, the level that the FDA considers a prescription level product. That's, that's the first thing. And then the second thing is um, comparing the different forms of retinol are never an apples for apples um, uh, discussion. And so you can go on the FDA website, or I'm sure there are beauty websites where they'll actually show a chart where one part of retinol propionate is equal to X part of retinoic acid, right? Or retinol palmitate is equal to X part of retinoic acid. But what you compare back to is the active form of retinol, active form of vitamin A. So there's actually a chart which will give you the equation of the ratios of what equals what. So all over-the-counter products or products that you can buy without a prescription should be under, I think the equivalent is point, um, well, I'm not going to quote the actual specific percentage, but it's under the FDA guidance of, as to what's not prescription, right? So for retinol propionate, that comes out to be 0.359%, just to be exact, right? I don't have the chart in front of me. Otherwise, I'd quote some of the other ones for you. Yeah, but there is a certain level of what the FDA considers. Now, the next thing that's so key to this, and this is part of the genesis as to why we created Shortlist, is that the larger number of ingredients that you've got in a bottle kind of co-compete with each other to get through the skin. And so we're, our, our, our cream is designed to go through passive diffusion, which basically means we're not going through skin cells. We're kind of navigating in between the cells. If you, look at, if you think about bricks and mortar, we're navigating in between the mortar, basically. And so that is kind of like a funnel. And if I've got 50 ingredients and in a product that I'm applying topically, well, all 50 ingredients are trying to fit down that tunnel. And so that led back into the, we've got to really simplify this because really, really, it's all about getting ingredients through your skin, but into the surface. Because a lot of ingredients stay at the surface. And you know, if you ever put a product on and you get that peeling or pelting that happens, yeah, yeah. that's actually product at the surface of your skin. So that can lead into skin overload. It can lead into a lot of different areas. But that was, was sort of further confirmation to us to say, you know what? We're not going to overload the skin. We're only going to give you the things that you need. And we're going to design our products to have that oil component and that water component of the skin and mind such that we can properly navigate that sort of oil-water ratio between the skin and between our products. When we start using shortlist skincare, what type of results can we expect to see? And how long will it take before we see any type of results? Immediately, the one thing that we also had in mind when we were developing these simplified products was they've got to be aesthetically pleasing as well. So yes, they've got to work. Yes, we want them to be simple. Yes, we want clean beauty. I mean, that's the overarching goal. But with that being said, They've got to be clean beauty, but they've got to be pleasant to use. So with our products, immediately you're going to feel a very rich, um, smooth, but light um, feeling in the cream. With the serum, you're also going to get this very nice, pleasant, fast-absorbing serum. You'll immediately notice that your skin is going to feel nicer upon putting those in there. Remember how I talked about like sodium hyaluronate? That's actually going to have a that's going to have that plumping fullness effect that you're going to feel immediately. So you're going to feel those things. But those aren't really um, the main drivers in creating the skin that is going to be the new skin that gets created um, that will eventually 
fill the top of your skin. But the point is, is that immediately you'll feel benefit. A week to two weeks in, you'll start to feel um, that uh, richness in your skin. But it's really about that 28 days out where you really notice the not just improvement in texture, but in tone. You will see um, uh, uh, see and be able to feel a difference in just how your skin will appear more youthful and vibrant looking. Um, so again, don't like to overpromise results um, because I know that when we when we consciously took things out, we took things out like acute plumpers. There are things that we could have put in there that just plumped your skin the moment you put it on. And I would do a before and after one minute picture and you'd be like, oh my God, you just made that fine line disappear. But guess what? At 9 p.m. that night, it'll probably show back up again because that thing wore off. We were not about products or ingredients like that. We were about giving you the meaningful, long-term sustaining benefit. Well, congratulations, because it really sounds like you've developed quite an amazing product. So now tell me, where can the listeners today find the products? Where can they buy them or find out more information about your products? Yeah, so we have, we have a website in which we're selling off, www.shortlistbeauty.com. Again, that's www.shortlistbeauty.com. That's all one word. And folks, I have put a link to the Shortlist website in the show notes. Thank you for that. And before we get bumped off, I want to thank you so much for being on today. Thank you for all the information you gave us. You were quite educational. And I know the listeners are going to enjoy this episode. They're going to get so much information out of today's episode. So thank you again for that. Thank you so much, Deanna. It was such a pleasure talking to you today. I could have talked for hours, but you know, I know you've got a show to run. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I could have talked to you a lot more, but unfortunately, we are out of time. But that gives me a good excuse to invite you back. Absolutely. We'd love to. Ask the Beauty Advisor is a part of the Beauty Radio Network. If you have a podcast or need help in starting a podcast and would like to be a part of a free, supportive network, then learn more by contacting Deanna at beautyradionetwork.com.